uh, Ranges School Board meeting. Um, such a gorgeous afternoon. It really is nice to see that the ice is out on the lakes and that spring is finally here. Uh, I do have one adjustment to the agenda. It's going to be uh, action item 9.4, and that is an, uh, an approval of an overnight senior trip to Old Orchard Beach. So with that in mind, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the April 15th? So okay, is there a second? Is Kathy second? Uh, any, any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Moving on, public comments. Do we have anyone here? Um, I did just get a text message from Erin Smith, and okay. she said, could you ask if my part will be before 7 o'clock, because if I keep driving, I could be there by 7. <laughs> uh, I hope that it can be before 7. If we need to, to switch the action items around to accommodate, we could also do that. But our agenda is pretty light this evening. Okay, awesome. I think, right. I think she might we have, have a couple of presentations this evening, which we're very much looking forward to. First is the pre-K-2 and middle school presentation in regards to the way in which they use their early release time uh, this past year on, the, on Tuesday workshop days. Hello, All right, I'll share the presentation. Just to introduce kind of like our team, um, Katie is the Title I teacher and Katie Willis works, sorry, Katie Willis. Um, Kathy works um, with Katie in Title I and Ashley Farr is the pre-K teacher and Dallas is the helper in there. They worked during their Tuesday time, they didn't really work with our group because they were learning um, more on the teaching strategies assessment tool that pre-K uses with Ashley being the new pre-K teacher. She was doing the webinars and learning how to do that developmental assessment um, that we use in pre-K. So that's what the Dallas and Ashley did during their Tuesday time, and the rest of us with so Alice and Love, Rebecca Ellis, did this. Um, okay, so this summer, um, looking on social media, I follow and Katie also, we follow a lot of the same um, teaching blogs and teaching communities on Facebook, Instagram, all of those places that you follow teachers, and a lot of um, talk was about this book called shifting the balance. And it was really um, focusing on changing how reading is being taught. A lot of us were taught the balanced literacy model, which you know I, I learned how to teach reading over 23 years ago. Um, and it's changed. Kids, kids have changed more brain sciences um, being done to really show us how kids are learning um, how to read. So this book was written by two educators that really showed how to shift the balanced literacy model more into the science of reading model, but also not to throw everything out that people that have been teaching for over 20 years have been doing. And we asked Seth and Georgia if they would support us having like a book study, and they did. So we started our book study, and then Allison found a class that was actually taught by the authors. Um, and it was an intense class. It was enough CEUs, I think, to almost count for your research. It was it was pretty in depth. Um, so we were very thankful for those Tuesdays. We had a live webinar every Tuesday, and then we had to do a lot of it on our own. We would meet up here, we'd do the class together until three, and then we'd pick up where we left off at home, give each other homework, read the book, and we're still in the process of discussing everything we have. So um, yes. Yes. yes, it was a lot. But I'm going to share with you. Shall we ask a yeah. question? Who are the authors in the book? Um, Jen Berkins and Carrie Yates. And they are um, consultants now, but they were in the education field and um, in the classroom. And they have one of them, I think they both have doctorates in literacy. Oh, Dr. Yeah, Carrie doesn't. But it was really neat because. You know, you read this and it's hard to be like, oh my gosh, why was I doing it that way? And they really made it clear that you weren't a bad teacher if you were teaching a balanced literacy. I mean, kids were still learning how to read. 
it's just now we know better. Science makes us learn better. So yeah, yeah they, they reiterate that every week to the shifts. Yeah, yeah. And that's the we don't know until you know. The shifting the balance like it's set up so it has different shifts. Here we are up in Katie's space, in another one's space, in big chairs. That's why we decided to put it here. There's the cover of the book. Nice hand out. There's six shifts. This is shift one. You're thinking how reading comprehension begins. Because a lot of the time, um, you're doing a read aloud, you might just, a teacher might just read the book and say, that was a nice book, close it, and then off to the shelf, on to recess, or lunch, or whatever. The book really concentrates on talking about new vocabulary, life experiences, um, just really thinking about the book and making sure that children are listening as the teacher is reading. And it talks a lot about just listening comprehension in general, how that's the beginning step of reading. <coughs> and it was really, you know, at home, we all know you read to a child before they're born, but that sometimes isn't always able to happen. And it talked about how when kids are missing that important part of their development, how it transfers into really impacting their comprehension level. So it really wants us to be focusing on building that vocab with them so that they have those things to draw on in their listening comprehension. It doesn't mean they have to read it, but they're listening and they're really storing all of those things in their brain. So when they do hear it, they're like, oh, they already have that prior knowledge. Sorry. So that when they're reading words, when they're starting to be you know, reading harder words like migration, then they already have this idea in their head of what migration is. So the next slide shows how that all pieces together. You got word reading like migration, listening comprehension because you've heard that word read by your teacher in the passage or whatever, and then that correlates to your reading comprehension as you read future passages or books. Okay, recommitting to phonemic awareness instruction. So when I was taught how to teach reading, I mean, you talked about phonemic awareness, you talked about phonics, we taught that way, but it wasn't the main focus. It was a lot more whole language. So, you know, you would teach your lesson, but then kids were just kind of, you gave them the book and um, you worked through that. But what they're saying and what research is now showing is that we really need to drive phonemic awareness. Um, phonemic awareness and phonics can be taught at the same time. But phonemic awareness is not something that you just stop in pre-K. It really keeps getting taught up through the grade levels and probably up through third grade. Um, phonemic awareness is where you listen to um, words and you can really manipulate those sounds. It's like word play. And what I've noticed is I've kind of changed going from kindergarten to pre-K back to kindergarten. What I've really tried to do this year, because I asked Georgia if I could do some training this summer and they paid you guys paid for me to do a like a month-long training this summer on phonemic awareness and chronic. <clears throat> I was able to take something that I would not have done regularly and try it with this class and I'm very excited about how it's worked so far. It'll be interesting to see how data comes out at the end of the year. Um, and that's kind of playing into what this book is saying. That's some phonemic awareness of just breaking down words into each each sound and then even manipulating the sounds like like you took the p away and you put another sound there and then it like popped popped so it's just manipulating the word play of sounds and now that we're all kind of been talking about this a lot more as our team like it's really fun because like if we're talking with a kid we're all kind of doing the same thing we're like oh you said bot what if i put a p at the end of bot you know we just kind of like play off each other And here's tip three of reimagining the way that we teach phonics. So actually, you can go ahead and get to the next slide. Sure. This one. So phonics is a systematic approach. And we know that as educators, but there's so many different programs, we're not sure which one's the best or which way. Should you teach the alphabet A through Z? Should you teach it um, as, as it's easier written? Should you teach it? There's just multiple ways. And so this um, program gives a systematic approach to teaching phonics. And they have their own scope and sequence. And which just means like when you should teach what, 
and what comes next in the sequence. And then um, it actually gives some new benchmarks for each grade level, which we, yeah. And they seem more appropriate. Yeah, they're much more appropriate. And one of the things 335 might have mentioned in their presentation was they had that um, curriculum, uh, kind of evaluated each curriculum. Yes. And what we found is when we went into this, we were like, oh, we need this big reading curriculum. We had some ideas. And then when 335 did their, their project, it was interesting to see that those ones that we thought were going to hit all of these new things that we're learning, they got like D's. You know? And there, what they found was that you really need to start just with the scope and sequence that everybody follows. Um, it's more about teacher education. Yeah. You have qualified, educated teachers. You don't need all the fancy bells and whistles. You just need well-trained teachers. So. Yeah. This one's huge for every single one yeah. of us. Um, High-frequency words. Those are sight words or dolch words or fry words. Yeah. You might have heard some of those. Um, this concept was brand new to us, um, how they said it, because they said most of those words are decodable. So there's no sense in trying to memorize 100 yeah, and whatever words when most of them can be decoded. That's when I felt bad about myself. I'm memorizing those sight words. I'm like, you're not going to be like, you're not going to be We found that, um, and Allie Mormon, who used to teach first grade, here sent us this link and 150 the 220 goal towards the words that kids are supposed to know by the end of their grade for sight words, the ones that are seen the most in their text. 150 of them can be sound, sounded out, which that like blew my mind. Yeah. And then I started looking and I was like, oh yeah, it can. Like, like they can sound that out. They just need to know the magic, you know, like all those strategies you teach them can be used in sight words. So that was pretty, yeah, pretty enlightening. So this is um, this is a list of the 13 most commonly used words in texts that these children will be reading, and most of those can be sounded out, like an "and" or "the," not "the," but uh, "in," "is." So some of those can be sounded out. And it was really neat to know that if they knew those 13 words of the 109 that they pulled out of that Dolchworth list, they that is going to cover 25 to 50 percent of those throughout the text in those early readers. Yeah. So really, you know, you want them. I think the old kindergarten benchmark used to be like 50 something sight words by the end of kindergarten. Like, you know, that's not appropriate. And kids barely, you know, some kids can do that definitely. I'm not saying that you shouldn't strive for that, but really you should be focusing on what's important and what's sounding good, because um, that's just going to help them. This is another big one. Uh, reinventing the way we use cues system. So when a student's coming across a word and they don't know it, the old way of using it was use the picture. Yeah. 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 There's a picture. That'll help you. And so this program says no. Like, don't look at the picture. Like, that's the last thing you want to teach a student to do when they're learning read. That was all they're going to do is post a picture. They're not actually reading it. So yeah, this is another big one. Um, and they, they, sh they just really want you to focus on those decoding skills. And they think that if you teach a kid first to rely on the picture, that that's not going to, the decoding's not going to be their go-to. The picture's going to be their go-to, which it used to be that that's what we taught. But we'll show you in the next couple of slides so you can see the difference now, why, why the shift is going to come out. Yeah. And then even reconsidering some text for the beginning. And go ahead and go to the next one. Sure. So yeah, this was like the picture we talked about. So these are like a level B, which is usually Chris, uh, probably November-ish. Like I like to dance after school. That's a level B. You want kids to be around there at Christmas in kindergarten. Um, the the I am Pam, I can nap is the same level in a decodable reader. Now. Most kids would not, that I've seen typically, that the one I like to dance is harder for them to get to. You can see that the text is heavier. But in November, kids were reading this because they've already learned all their letters, all their sounds, and they're starting to blend them. So you can see by looking at the picture 
that's really not helping them read that text. They really have to focus on their coding skills, which is what we're teaching them. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and we do have next steps, things that we realized that we needed to. Yeah. And we've actually purchased several books from this company called Benchmark Education. And they have actually just recently got on board with Wiley Flip. Yeah. He's yeah. like the phonics guru who yeah. they did a lot of work with this company. And I've actually talked to the representative and she says that he's like famous now and everyone's like following him because he's this whole phonics system, the whole way you teach um, just reading to young readers. And so they have these new decodable books, and I asked for a sample. So these are the samples, and I just got them this week. So the teachers are actually going through them, and we can already tell how text heavy the books are, but the students would actually be reading them instead of just looking at picture trying to figure out what the word might be. They're actually going to be reading. And it all goes, you know, like this is long O. Um, this is why long e vowel team. So everything that they would learn in a phonic system, they would be applying to an actual book. Because a lot of times, too, when they have those early readers, the content's kind of boring, the pictures are kind of long, and or it's paper, which sometimes we like paper books because they can go home and they can keep reading them at home. But kids don't feel like they're actually readers until they have a book in their hand. So these books offer that. So that's something we're looking into um, to possibly purchasing next year. And we did, we put money in our budget when budget was due because we really, it was before we did this class and we really thought we were going to need one of those big reading programs. But what we found was what we really need is more training, time to do the training and time to really make our own um, materials that would follow their scope and sequence and, you know, more books, so encodable readers and stuff. So. And actually, um, Shelly and I even started this school year, we had this bright idea that we were going to make a tutorial for parents on how they can help their child to learn how to read and then she's like wait a minute we <laughs> <laughs> yeah we have videos we had the whole thing we started yeah we were doing it the old way we're like we can't send this out to parents we know better now so we actually halted that we'll start it again next year but with our new knowledge of what we've learned about the science of reading okay. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you so, yeah. um, it's interesting to me to see just how this is mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and not not only the title is that, but and who knows in 10, 15 years All right. we'll we'll have have somewhere else. But thank you for looking at what's current and what works for our kids. And then my only question is, is there a, is there are there materials like in our library or in the classrooms that can be kind of pulled and we're made? hoping that with the money that we did budget that there are there are not full nice. programs, but supplemental materials yep. that you can buy. Um, we did find Free K uses aggregate phonics, aggregate phonemic awareness. It's uh, it's almost it's probably pretty scripted every day, but it follows that scope and sequence, and it goes up to second grade. And it's, those are only like maybe six or hundred bucks for the book, but it tells you day one, this is what you do, and it builds on those skills every day. So we're hoping to be able to buy those or something like that for each class, and then. Just building that library, you know, we want we want the teachers to be able to go in and say, okay, my kids are working on, you know, the long A sound. So we need to go in and we have this text that follows that phonics rule, and then we have these centers. So they're going to pull those, and Katie might be using them with Title One, but I might have a group of kids that that are already used in kindergarten. So it's just available for everyone, not just. Class. And it first means too, these are like there's nonfiction video yeah. yeah. photographs. I love yeah. the pictures. Yeah. The pictures yeah. are really yeah. eye catching for yeah. kiddos. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. Good Thank job. Okay. Uh, moving on then to comments from various folks. Oh, I'm sorry, middle school. Excuse me. Whoa, you're saying, what about us? <laughs> well, 
thank you for having us. You guys did an awesome job. Yes. I kind of wish we could have gone first. <laughs> 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 you guys, really, that was great. You used your time well. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to have Tuesdays to work together and to really collaborate. I think in teaching, um, you feel like you're always trying to jump on the next thing, but you're not having time to really do what is happening in the classrooms. And this allowed us to really just stop and slow down and reevaluate what we were doing in the classroom and if we wanted to make um, any modifications or changes or just re-examine our program. It was nice to have that time. I, I have lamented so much in the past that there's not. So really thank you for that opportunity. Um, we use this time to really discuss our vision, what the middle school team looks like, um, and what it can look like moving into the future. And something that you guys talked about was just the changing nature of students. Um, so we looked at our students and we talked about engagement and we talked about applicable skills um, and just um, what a typical school program might look like. And in, and in looking at our vision, we um, kind of tossed around this idea for a long time and we decided to jump in to look at an interdisciplinary approach to a unit and some project-based learning. Um, and it's something that we've been talking about forever, it's just really it's been hard to find the time to make that happen. So that's really what we dedicated our time to and looked at what we are all doing in each of our classrooms and where there are opportunities to overlap with content and also with skills um, to create a broader learning experience for the kids and hopefully to help with engagement because they can look at something through so many different lenses and perspectives. Um, so the two things that really came out were out of us just brainstorming and batting ideas around for that idea of engagement for all learners, not just some learners, and also an authentic application of what we're doing. So, you know, we can read a book and they can do a test, but how are they going to be able to apply that content or that skill or that knowledge um, outside of the classroom? So this was a really good opportunity for us to be able to try it out for the first time um, with all of us kind of on the same page. Um, not that we haven't been on the same page, but all of us able to come together and put something into action to see how it would go. So um, we um, put this interdisciplinary unit together. Um, and you'll see here, we give a brief summary of what each of our roles will be. But we'll talk more about this when we get into our individual slides. But for ELA, students who create profiles of range of people who reflect the unique culture of our community and social studies, the ranging history and heritage studies that would culminate, culminate with an oral history project. So the whole theme of our unit was range through study and trying to get kids involved and invested in knowing more about this community. So ELA and social studies really working together to do some research on this area and then go out into the community and find people to ultimately put together a project that, that we'll discuss more um, as we get into our presentation. Um, science and Atlantic salmon and an ecosystem study that uh, Sarita will talk more about. And then using data in math um, from Rangeley and actually applying it, doing um, analyzing, um, analyzing the data and plotting the data and figuring out the best approaches to what you do when you have a body of data and how to break it down. Sean, would you mind hitting the next sure. slide? Thank you. So our goals for this project were relevance and meaning. Um, so really making the learning relevant for the kids. So again, this idea of arranging study, it's relevant to all of our lives. What does it mean to all of the students? Um, and then with that relevance and meaning, trying to find an authentic application of the learning. And we'll talk what that authentic application will be. We're going to see it in a few different ways throughout our unit. Um, for our presentations. Also project-based learning. So we, some years ago, went to King Middle School and they are really project-based in their approach and their interdisciplinary. We were so blown away the way that all of the teams worked together and what the kids were able to create. And in the end, it was always, it wasn't a test or an essay, but it was a project that could go back into the community that could be of some use. 
So I think that's when we years ago started really batting around this idea of how can we do this. So um, for us, one of our goals was that project-based learning. And then um, recognize these learning as a whole, sorry, sorry. Recognizing learning as a whole and not segregated areas. So for the kids to really understand that what you learn in one class is applicable in another class and in, and in different areas of life. So they're not seeing learning in these just little vacuums that aren't connected at all. Um, so, and it also allowed us to be collaborative and learn together as a whole um, and really build a sense of community through our learning and going out into a range of So that, those were our goals for the project. Um, so for the social studies aspect, um, the unit that, that I am doing in social studies and everybody will, um, you know, have their own kind of piece of range lead, but I'm looking at the history and the story of range and then and now. So the objective of the unit I'm doing is to explore the heritage and history of range league, but through different disciplines, different lenses and different perspectives. Um, so part of what, um, excuse me, sorry, yes. Okay, so part of the way that we're going to do that is actually by going out into the community so that they won't just be, um, you know, reading from the few books I have in the classroom, um, looking at pictures on the smart book. We're actually going to go out into the community. We're going to the Outdoor Heritage Museum, where we'll have, uh, I've been working with the new, um, I guess, director of the museum, Michelle Landry, and she's wonderful. And we've been collaborating on how to design a program that will work with the kids. And she has two community volunteers who are going to come in and work with the kids and bring them through. And then we'll have some guiding questions that the students will need to journal on. And, um, think about while they're looking at the artifacts. Um, and uh, she's also arranged for a scavenger hunt through the museum so that they can kind of get some guided time with the docents and then some of alone time as they go through the museum. But I also see this as a really good opportunity for kids to learn how to be out in the community in a, in a situation like when they're in a museum and to just practice with them some of the, the etiquette and how to conduct themselves we've been all because of COVID, we've been kind of in our own bubbles for so long. So I think this is a really nice real world opportunity for them to just practice those skills. Um, this The primary standard for my unit that I'm going to be focusing on is just really looking at secondary and primary sources as they work through to develop that historical perspective. Um, and some of the primary sources will be through doing interviews with people in the community. This is George will talk about that as well, but we're going to look at the history, the then, and we're going to look at the history that's happening in front of us now and have kids out uh, meeting people in the community and getting their stories. Um, and the goal, the student goal is to increase overall engagement and learning through the interdisciplinary project-based study. And I think with project-based learning, the application that's really important is being able to give back to the community. So um, part of the goal is um, through this study that there will be a way to apply that knowledge and creating an artifact that will go back to um, the, the town of Rangeley. And that's where Robin um, will pick up. Next slide. Yep. Thank you. Welcome. So um, that's a picture of the Nile Historical Cemetery. And it's one of those artifacts that we have right in our own backyard. How many of you have been to that cemetery and looked at the graves? So, so just a couple. Um, that's Luther Court um, up on the left. That's his headstone. And I believe he, that was the first family who um, came to Rangeley. And they actually were embarrassed by their last name, believe it or not. So they changed it. It was Nile, right? It became Nile? I think so. Nile or there, I, I can't remember right now, but they changed the name. So there are people in Rangeley who are descendants of that family, or there have been people here. And um, oh, the Niles now, yeah, I don't Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah, changed yeah. the last name. So anyway, um, these are two of the headstones at the Nile Cemetery, which is right on Route 4. So you all drive by it. But looks like the headstones were cleaned maybe in the past year because they're very white. And so my piece of this is for my students to create an interview in which they can have oral histories 
from people who they select. So to kick the project off, we're going to do a day of field trips um, that Kelsey explained in part. And we'll be going there and we'll do some headstone rubbing. And then we'll come back and just do a little finite research, but see what they can find out about these people whose names they rubbed when they were um, in the cemetery. And the eventual goal this that will happen this year is that they will go out into the community and choose a person who they would actually really like to interview, somebody who they think is important and relevant, has meaning to them. And from that interview, we'll, of course, spend a lot of time working on developing good, deep questions. They will then write narrative essays on those people. And the narrative essays will capture the people. I've done this before a really long time ago. Was, Karen, I think you were around. You absolutely were around when I did the scheme project. And we had the premiere and the theater. <coughs> And so we interviewed people who were instrumental in skiing in the Rangeland community. And that book exists at the public library now. So if you want to see it, it's there. And it was a multidisciplinary unit. So we involved high school and the art department. And at the time I was teaching, I think, third and fourth grade. But the artifacts are really beautiful, the ones that we created. So this is going to be some of that. Um, so we'll come up with these written profiles that we'll have permanently. Um, and let's see what else do I want to say. I think I think that that really that is my piece of this. But that previous yes. project you did is at our public library. It is. Now? Yeah. Oh, that's it great. is. There's a um, there was a movie which I sadly do not have. It was on a DVD. We premiered the movie, high school was involved in it, and we premiered it at the movie theater. But the book that my kids primarily did includes sketches and writing about Roger Page and Patsy Page. And just like I can't remember everyone now, but it was pretty comprehensive and it was a huge fun to do. So I think the really important part of this is that students will have student choice. Because if they just are given a name, it might not be a person that they would connect to, but who knows, Karen, maybe you'll be <laughs> one of the subjects of an interview. So, uh, so yeah, that's it. That's my piece. Oh, sure. So, um, one thing with this book is, I'm working with Michelle Landry, I was talking about that with the book, we would like to have it be something that can live in historical society and then each year you know if this project continues continue and keep adding to it so in a sense there will be um a reference um or a, a, a current history and stories of people who are making history you know in more recent years so that this will be a living dynamic document that will continue to grow throughout the time by the way you forgot to mention something but I forgot to mention michelle Lynch. Oh, yeah. Yeah. From Campobello. Yeah. She was the director, yeah. director at Campobello yeah. at FDR's summer home. Yeah. She's, yeah. And she's really excited to collaborate with the school. Um, we actually are talking about in the fall, Barry Dana, who is from the Penobscot Nation. He um, does a lot of education um, around the state of Maine on Wabanaki. And we've already been talking with him, she and I, about him coming in the fall. And she said that the museum can help sponsor that. So she's really excited to develop this relationship. Yes. So that's something that was kind of born out of this, planning these field trips, these natural relationships are popping up. And I forgot to mention too, we are going to go to the main forestry museum as well. Oh. And um, we're going to watch one other place, the hatchery, but I'm not going to speak yeah. about that. <laughs> because <laughs> that's that's a nice. amazing person. Yeah. Thank you. OK, sure. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry to ramble. I'm the new science teacher. Um, I didn't come and meet you guys when I got hired, and I'm so sorry, but it was my eighth grade uh, recognition night from the previous school. But this is me. It's very nice to meet you all. And um, my, my little bit with the um, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary project is the Atlantic Salmon. And very good timing, Seth, uh, on your presence, because Seth is one kind of gave me a little cookie. Hey, this is a cool idea. You should do it. 
Um, and I'm kind of like the yes girl. So I was like, yeah, let's go, let's give it a go. And it ties in really nicely with um, our project that we're doing as a team. Um, so the Atlantic salmon have been mostly being raised by the sixth grade and um, we got them as eggs. They're now alvin and every day it's just something new in the tank. Um, you can start to see their uh, fins, their dorsal fin uh, forming, which is really cool. Um, and we're going to be releasing these Atlantic salmon into small spawns. So it's not like they're going to be going somewhere foreign. It's right here in their backyard. Um, so a really good personal connection. And so up to the point before we even got the eggs, having one of those um, Tuesday PD days was super important. I had my mentor from the Fish Friends program come. We spent about two and a half to three hours setting up uh, the tank. That's the February 1st date. Um, and I know you're like, gosh, wow, that's a long time. But um, it was needed. So I appreciated that very, very much. And uh, my mentor was just the sweetest. And we got the eggs um, pretty much at the after February break. And March 25th, they started to really hatch and come out. That's when we saw a lot of activity. Um, it was fun when the eggs came because, uh, like, Interesting, interesting. <laughs> and the kids like we're just like oh, okay. So um, we we put on the tank and everything. But uh, one of the things we did to tie it back to science more instead of just a neat thing happening in the classroom, um, our whole new uh, theme this year has been life science. Um, so biology, uh, anatomy, and ecology is pretty much what I like to finish out with in the spring, just because of the beautiful weather. It was an excuse to get outside um, and connect some science concepts. So we did the life cycles, um, and then we looked at how they were impacted um, by humans as well as other factors within their ecosystem. And I think the kids, for the most part, had a lot of fun. We still have the big release, so that anticipation is building up. Um, and that's going to be happening May 27th, so right before Memorial weekend. And um, we're hopefully going to have a main guide there. And I still, it's on my to-do list, as to get in touch with um, the newspaper. Um, Eileen Holcomb has also been a huge part of um, yeah, this process. Fine. Yeah, she is amazing. Um, so we're going to try and get a, a newspaper involved with that too, just to get a She has a really comprehensive program every summer for students. It's one day a week where she she kind of runs them through the whole main guide guiding process. And the kids do a lot with that, so she'll be ideal. Oh, and she has been. To yeah. Connect them with the kids later on. Yes, yeah. yeah. They, they made her cards for like saying thank you to the yeah. fish, but yeah, she's been she's been amazing. Um, but that's kind of been my piece of it, and I'm not gonna say any more because then it's gonna go to jail. Like another little piece. <laughs> All right. So with the sixth and seventh graders, um, I have the standards of data displays and displaying numerical data. So I'm picking up with the fish theme and the history theme. And picking out, we're going to do some data on the Range Lake, Lake ice updates that are all in our books and all. So we're going to see what data displays might work well with that data. We'll see what they come up with. And um, then choosing some Franklin County data on the website and lots of history back in years of salmon release. Mm -hmm. So next year, the salmon data will be in that data set and we'll be able to use that as well. So that's my plan. Haven't started it yet, but it's soon. The sixth graders are working on their data plots right now. Oops. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. So again, just thank you for this opportunity that we were able to slow down and breathe and talk and figure out what each other actually are doing and build together. It's been really great. Um, it gave us time to plan and prepare and outline this unit, which we hope really will benefit. The students um, and I think it benefited us as a team as well so moving forward we can use this experience to build other collaborative project-based learning opportunities if we feel like this really worked in it and our you know, student goals of engagement um, and that applied learning seem to um, have been a positive experience then we can continue and build on this and perhaps build into other units um, so we'll be getting students oh what was the next year promise sorry there. <laughs> we hate that. Um, but based on student feedback, um, you know, at the end of the unit, we'll be able to see kind of what worked, what we might change, and how it can keep growing um, to more areas within the community. I think it's just exciting to hear what you 
have so productively used with the time that you've had available. And I can't uh, even begin to, to tell you how much I support you having the professional development time to work together. I think it's critical to the overall development of your programs and kids directly benefit from that time you're able to spend working with one another. I really appreciate, I want to just say, appreciate so much that, um, you know, when it was brought to all of you that you agreed to this. And this is probably the first year, I think, in my teaching career where I haven't had people come to my classroom and complain about the lack of time to do everything. Mm -hmm. I think we really felt that we had time. It was wonderful. We obviously yeah. used it very well. Thank you. I think mm -hmm. I really enjoy seeing like the rollover from one subject to the next. I feel like you know the collaboration between like the kids feel like they're really working towards something because you all kind of have the same theme per se, not necessarily exactly the same, but you know it keeps the kids engaged and entertained. And it's really cool to see what you guys have been doing with that time. And I think it's really crucial and important. So good job, guys. Okay, thank thank you. you. Other comments or feedback. Great job, ladies. Okay. All right. Now moving uh, to the section of comments. Um, I, I only have a, a, a couple of brief comments. I want to extend a personal appreciation to Deb Ladd, who, as you are all are aware, last week was Teacher Appreciation Week, and she um, came over to the school and organized goodies for the teachers. Uh, we had a fruit platter and some treats uh, as a way of the board saying thank you for all of your hard work and your commitment to students here in Rangeley. And um, I appreciated that you took the time to do that for the board. Thanks, Dan. The, the treats are really good. <laughs> <laughs> the treats are really good. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's not over yet. Yeah. We're still planning other ways to say thank you. Thank you. Um, so having said that, I'll move on to Georgia. Okay. Um, in the process of wrapping up uh, teacher evaluations, um, Seth and I have been kind of working on those. We're in the process of um, completing those. This year, we were required to only do, really only do second year probationary, but we did do our first year um, teachers as well. Um, lots of planning happening for the end of the year events. The, the, I just feel like the ball's starting to roll down the hill and it's just like going. And, <laughs> But, but I forgot what that feeling feels like because we haven't really had that feeling in a while. So it's nice to have that feeling of, you know, all of these things and, it, you know, just it's exciting. Um, I want to also announce that the spring concert um, is June 1st at 6 p.m. So put that on your calendars. And we are knee deep in interviewing for the three open teaching positions. Um, one for grade five, middle school ELA, and high school English. So hopefully bringing some names to the board next month. And finally for me, as, as I announced, I believe it was last month, um, Doris Mitchell has um, is, is retiring, and she wanted me to read something to you all. <clears throat> Dear Superintendent Campbell and RSU 78 School Board, after 35 years of teaching at Rangeley Lakes Regional School, I have decided to retire at the end of this school year. I'm grateful for the time I spent in this community working to educate its children, first as a middle school teacher, and then later as the fifth grade teacher. Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't going to do this, but I kind of can't help it. I love her. I sincerely have enjoyed watching the students learning well academically, as well as helping them navigate the social and emotional atmosphere of the classroom. One of the pleasures I have from teaching in the same school system for so long is to see former students successful in the life they have chosen. I am thankful for each of my coworkers, some of whom are my former students. It has been a pleasure to work with you. 
to be supported by you, and to learn from you. It is great to work in a place where so many people care for each other and the students they teach. To the current administration, thank you for your support and guidance during these challenging and unscripted pandemic years. I know many decisions were difficult to make, but I, leave, I believe you all <clears throat> made the best decisions in the interest of students and staff. RLRS will always be a part of my identity. I am proud to say that it has been my second home. I will miss the challenge of working with students day in and day out. With love and grat and great affection, Doris Mitchell. Wow. Moving on to Seth. Yeah, um, yeah, it's been busy, um, really busy. We uh, <laughs> kind of know which way we're going, but it's a lot of um, just there's a lot of good stuff going on. The at the softball, baseball teams with us going high school softball, having fun. Um, we had a tough game today. We have a lot of young kids and they're having a blast. It's uh, it's like the basics and it's it's fun. Um, and yesterday. Was it yesterday? When did we go to the main school? Main school? <laughs> yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> yesterday morning. Is today Tuesday? <laughs> I thought today was, yeah, I was wondering if today was Thursday. Um, so yesterday, Monday, we went to the main school masonry, and Mrs. Mitchell's husband is a who. But we got there, and he greeted us, and the one thing he uh, he taught us, it is not masonry, it's masonry. And he, that's his big, that's the first lesson he teaches, because when he was a mason, he would go in, and somebody would say, thank you for doing our masonry. <laughs> and he would correct them and he goes told the kids he's like that's not always the best method to get work or to deal with people so he, his new mission is the first lesson he teaches is his masonry um i'm a pretty good mason um i think i, I might go to school there we built it <laughs> but i didn't know it was a competition beforehand on a trailer but we built a pyramid and the kids like it was awesome we had two kids that were within three sixteenths of an inch of plumb by eye it was like five on the bottom four three two one but that was a really cool visit. And that's part of the uh, foster tech work in the middle school. We've had culinary arts going on now. We had um, carpentry and the first was photography. photography and they've had a ton of fun. So that was an excellent field trip and um, Ms. Mitchell's uh, husband's a hoot. Yeah, we have interviews all day tomorrow. We're doing five interviews for the high school um, English teacher position. So we're getting them all done in one day. We'll see if we have to do some follow-ups, but we're starting the state testing windows are open. So we did high schools done in UIA. Um, everyone else starts next week. It's Crandall, we did session one of the science today and that was successful. Um, yeah, just a lot going on. You know, look at the calendar. We've got four middle school field, three middle school field trips, three middle school field trips this month. Uh, so. It's going the fast. Huh? And we also have the MLTI student conference too. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah that's all I, I, I yeah. <laughs> That's what I have. I didn't know if I was going to make it for this. We were up on the field, we wrapped up and got here. So, yeah. But just a lot of good stuff going on. Um, and it's going to be done just like that, I think. Yeah. 27 days. Yeah, 27 <laughs> days. Okay, our student reps. Um, varsity softball has started, and we've had three games total so far. We have um, four games coming up this week. Wednesday and Friday. Um, we won one game, we've lost two, but overall it's been a really fun experience and everybody's really enjoying it. It's been very fun to do. And prom is going to be May 28th, and the juniors are in charge of planning that. All right, also the seniors have just started to plan graduation. We have graduation and class day, so we started to plan those. Graduation is June 11th. Class day is the 9th. Yeah. <laughs> and um, this past Friday, my dad talked about the NOEA testing a little bit, but also this past Friday was the advanced placement deadlines. So just a, there was seven students that took AP classes this year. In AP Art, um, Emily Eastlack, Winnie Larochelle, Lily LaValle, Logan Buecher, Ella Shaver, and Bristol Quimby all submitted portfolios to the AP um, College Board. They sent in physical copies of their best works and then they photographed the rest and wrote paragraphs about them so they'll receive scores on those. And I take the AP um, United States History exam. 
So all of those finished on Friday. So now everybody's kind of relieved because that'll wrap up. But that's pretty much what's been going on. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to our committee reports. Uh, Kathy, the policy committee. Uh, we did not meet this month because it was one of those months where it was too close to this meeting and I was away last week. So uh, where our meeting will have on June 6th. Next June, week, okay. June 6th. What time? Uh, at 3, right? Haven't we been doing it at 3 or 2 30? I go by you what you need to say. We have something before curriculum sometimes before then we go to classes. So three, yeah, we're yeah, we gonna have curriculum before that. Um, curriculum, yeah, I was gonna ask that question. I was gonna see if I could get that report now too, because sure. again, it didn't meet this month, so it will be June sixth, either before or after the uh, policy. So, which will it be? Teachers, workers. Well, you're going to be in schedule I don't we know. Have historically, yeah. at I would just schedule it. Schedule yeah. it for I mean, 2 30? Yeah, because we're doing baseball. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll schedule it for June 6th at 2 30. And we'll be the best we can. That's it. Hey, thank you very much, Kathy. And just a, a personal a, a appreciation to you and all your hard work on the policy committee. I know last month we had a Marathon, I believe, of policy Thompson. So we are really in probably the best shape for our policy handbook that we've been in in years in terms of its currency. And that's due to your leadership. And we really appreciate that a great deal. Thank you. I know it's lots of hours of work on your part. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Don't be good. Just keeping me on my toes. <laughs> I'm not sure who's going to report out for the finance committee. Uh, we were there. We were um, there today. We were there. <laughs> uh, and we, I think really the discussion was about what, is, what information is it that we really want to have moving forward. Right. And there wasn't really anything to discuss yet, per se, I think it was related to finance. Okay, thanks, Georgia. I appreciate that. The facilities committee. Well, yeah. I have a lot to talk about. Oh, good. I'll, have that, but I'll, I'll be brief. Um, we met last Thursday. We meet the first Thursday of the month in this conference room up here. And we talked about the bid. There's Sarita still hiding over there. Yep, she is about the middle school science room. Um, no surprise that things came in way over budget. So it's a work in progress to kind of figure out what will be um, available for her when school starts in the fall and what we can maybe push back another year. So. Um, just everything's expensive and everything we're waiting for, and there you go. Um, the outdoor classroom, Sean gave us an update about that, and the hot, I think just a quick summary, there's going to be a hot spot available out there. If I remember my notes right, the range is anywhere from three to 500 feet, which is a pretty good range. Um, things are password protected, and I believe there's something for students, something for public and admin is that correct yeah outdoor wi-fi um <laughs> access points positioned on the building right. um really trying to strive for the outdoor classroom to have connectivity but also field and um yeah it's a long process with a lot of paperwork and, um, thanks to sean that is moving forward and he's really really done all of the work behind the scenes so a big thank you to you sean oh, for Appreciate all you have done that. um the portable classroom and its floor is an ongoing challenge. Uh, Jeff has got some, some quotes and some information. It looks like what we're going to do is tear out what's old and yucky, um, put some sort of sealant down, and then a subfloor, a pad, and new carpet, and that will hopefully solve the smell problem, the potential mold problem. And it was also suggested that we put some sort of, not necessarily LOB, but those water hog mats and put that outside as you first come in, and that really will cut down on all of the, um, the junk that come in on people's feet. So that's, again, that quote is more than we were hoping for, but we're wheeling and dealing and trying to make that happen. Uh, library shelving, we got three quotes from Miss Abby, and it looks like we're going to move forward with the Demco shelving. I don't know if that's been ordered yet or not. Um, 
privacy and HIPAA. We're, we're in the process. We're in the process, like everything. So <clears> yeah. Yeah. By, yep. yeah, we need a full section replaced. We'll be able to do that after the evening, right? And so, so okay. before we got. Yep. Um, we Jeff also informed us that one of the buses did not pass inspection at this time. Rusted brackets, I believe. It's also pretty high mileage. And so the plan is for just to take that one out of commission. Um, Jeff feels we've got plenty of buses with this with the uh, fleet that we have, and the plan is to in the next budget cycle to put in or new bus, a new bus, a new bus. Um, and then the other thing is uh, with the Esser money that we've been gifted, uh, we have ordered a 14 passenger van that is ordered, um, and that will allow. Transportation. The nice thing about those is you don't need any sort of special license. Any licensed driver employee can, can drive one of those, and hopefully that will uh, cut down to a little more efficient. I'm thinking than uh, some of the bigger buses. And so that's something to look forward to. The water test that was public information has come back, and we're on the right track with all of that. And Sean and Jeff are going to be doing some training this summer with. And right now, what kind of system? I got Siemens, and that's Siemens, all I got. Siemens, yeah. Um, the yeah, yeah, the Zego system, the migration from Insight to the Zego. So part of it's mm -hmm. software, computer type of stuff, and the other part is the pollution control type of stuff. So. That'll be some training um, coming up for these gentlemen this summer. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm working with we. Uh, a project manager reached out to me in regards to the, the console we need to purchase to put in the IT room. So. With the um, Siemens package we have purchased, one person can go to the, to the training. So I asked how much it was for the additional person and who would be the right person to go. So either way, both of us need to have the information, but we'll find out who and when soon. Great. And thank you to everybody that made all of these proposals and done all the research to figure out how much things are going to cost and how long we're going to have to wait for it. It's, it's slow, but we're all in that same same situation, not all in the same boat, but all in the same situation. So, this is committee. Mm -hmm. Thanks, okay, Jeff. great. Any questions or comments? All right, so moving along to uh, the communication groups. Neither Joanne nor uh, or Chris are here this evening, but I think that group pretty much has wrapped up its obligation to meet the, uh, the law that passed in October. October the 18th specifically, it required school boards to have policies and procedures in place for communicating with both internally staff and then externally in the community. And I think over the course of this past year, we've done a lot of work around communication, school communication, and uh, we have adopted two policies that directly uh, address that. So in terms of meeting the, um, the essence of that law, we're in great shape. And I think that committee's work is done. So we we'll move on to appointments, resignations, nominations, and transfers. And I'll turn it back over uh, to Georgia. Okay. <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm having a terrible time with allergies. I do have um, an, <clears throat> an appointment. Um, we have a new bus driver. He was hired May 2nd. His name is Kevin uh, Banfield. And he comes to us from Sanford, Maine. He was a former manager of Ledgemere Transportation and also a former employee of Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. So we're lucky to have him. And he's going to be a golf course employee as well. Wow. Golf is useful. After he drives. Absolutely. Yeah, we've already had that conversation. It works too well. And I do have a number of resignations, sadly. Um, Russ Brooks, who has been a bus driver for us, he's been doing our foster check uh, run. He has resigned uh, effective May 11th. Tina LaRusso, <clears throat> who was our therapist, has also resigned. Um, her um, effective date of res resignation will be May 13th. Um, she is uh, pursuing other interests, and we're very happy for her. 
Brittany Russell, our pre-K guidance six through eight interventionist, is, re is resigning effective at the end of the school year. Um, sad to hear that. And also very sad to hear um, that Heidi Deary, our high school guidance counselor, student services director, and affirmative action officer is also resigning at the end of the school year. Her last date is still to be determined because her contract goes through the summer. So very sad about all of this. Thank you, Georgia. So moving on to action item, oh, excuse me, 9.1. 9 Motion to approve second year probationary teacher contracts. You want to speak to that person? Um, no, I think it's just it's a motion as well. Just a motion as read. Yeah. Okay, can I have uh, someone make a motion? So, okay, thank you, Karen. And a second, for Johanna. Okay, and that includes, uh, is it, how do you pronounce your first name? I apologize. Satira? Sarita. Sarita. Yeah. Randall, Rebecca Ellis, Serena. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I managed to massacre it. I apologize. <laughs> Kim, Kim Hockmeyer, Ashley Rose, and Kate Willis. Kate Willis. Katie Willis. Katie Willis. As of second year probationary. Okay. Any discussion? Um, yes. Yeah, just a comment. Um, just how happy we are with Serena. She's. I. Uh, I'm. Evaluate her, observe her. She's in my team. Um, like the salmon thing, like it was in the summer, right? I was like, hey, you want to do salmon? Oh, sure. And she's done an amazing job with that. Um, I've been in her class a lot. I did frog, spent a half day in there, frog dissection. She's got a great way with kids, built relationships, and we're very lucky. Yes, Rita. So thank you. And I do the others. I did all the other, I evaluate all the other ones, and ditto to that. We're so lucky to have them. Kim Hockmeyer is a uh, a veteran teacher who's brought a lot to the table this year. Um, Rebecca Ellis is going to be a new mother here in a, few, in a little bit. We're all very happy for her. And Ashley Ferrara, she's just nailing it in pre-K. And Katie Willis doing a great job with the intervention and the GT. And that's a lot to manage. <laughs> doing a great job with that. Terrific. Okay. So all those in favor of accepting that motion? No move? Okay, terrific. We'll go on then to a motion to approve the continuing teacher contracts. Rowena Hathaway and Lindsay Richards. So moved. So moved. Can I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments? I will also I use both on my team. Um, so two years. We know what's going on in two years. So both of these people did their first two years of education during um, the pandemic and coming out of it. Lindsay Richards started when we remember we had a well, we had a phys ed teacher that left and then she came and then she had a baby and had to leave and then came back um, fully remote and she did it. Um, so just she's doing a great job, uh, doing some good things. She does a lot of extra stuff like the winter kids and puts it all in. She's halfway teaching all of our high school math, do all of this with remote and in-person and managing multiple preps in one room. So that we're very lucky that we have them through this and it's impressive that your first two years of education were like that. So yes, we are. I guess some grit. <laughs> <laughs> How many great so. books do you have? <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Okay. That's terrific. And it's been a tough couple of years and it's just wonderful that you guys have all stepped up to the plate and done such a wonderful job. So, all those in favor of approving that motion. Okay, moving on to our next motion to approve the overnight and out of state field trip to Music in the Parks Musical Festival. And I think I was like, she is like a minute away, too. She was trying to start there. She is here, but she stepped into the lane. Oh. Oh. Yeah. She was texting me, how much time do you have? I wasn't sure what she meant. I was like, are you trying to get somewhere to? Continue the Google Meet, or <laughs> I like I get it now. It all makes sense. <laughs> oh, wait, wait a minute. We can go. We can let's flip nine three and nine four. Let's oh, go she, on. I think she's both of those. She's both. She's both, both of those. Yeah. Okay, we'll do ten one instead. Okay. 
uh, a motion to set the date for the June meeting. And as you probably realize, that that meeting is specific for us to approve the validation of the town vote on the budget. And essentially, that's a, our only piece of, of work uh, for that meeting that night. So we would normally be scheduled to meet on the 14th of June, have our board meeting that Tuesday. And um, the town vote will be in by then. So we could either meet on that date, our, our regularly scheduled time, and or we could meet briefly on Wednesday the 15th. So I guess I'm looking to you to give me some guidance on what you think is the most appropriate. Yes, Kayla. If I need to come on the 15th for vacation, I can always assume not yep. a problem, but just for peace of mind, I we will be traveling that day. Okay. Any other comments, Kayla? I'm, I'm confused. That's all the best. Well, we have we actually have to get together to meet after the validation vote for the towns to approve that. Yeah, so we have to get together for that. But I guess, so the question is, do we want to meet and have our regular board meeting still on the 14th and then come back together on the 15th to approve that? Or do we just want to have our board meeting on the 15th? With the, uh, with the validation. So it would be regular business and the validation. Right, because, and I apologize, I didn't do a very good job of explaining that. Okay. Because those two valid. things need to have happen. And the validation needs to occur the day after. So, um, can I get a motion for the board meeting on either the 14th or the 15th, recognizing that if we meet on a regularly scheduled time, we'll have to come back together on the 15th anyway for a short period. Make a motion that we just roll it all into one and meet on the 15th. Great. Okay. Can I have a second to that motion? Thank you, Kayla. Um, any discussion? Any further discussion on that? And obviously, Kayla, you can join us by Zoom. Thank you. All those in favor? Okay, so, so we'll move our board meeting to the 15th. Great. Erin, you're with us now. So we have a motion to <laughs> approve first your state field trip uh, music in the park. The music festival. I would have been here sooner, but I break for duck. So that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very appreciate it. And he did so. not want to cross the road. So anyway. The Six Flags trip is music in the parks. Um, we had originally planned to do it at the beginning of the year and then there weren't any overnight trips, so we bagged it. And then we decided there could be overnight trips, so we decided to scramble and throw it together. Um, my chorus is about 18 kids this year. Um, we meet around once a week for 30 minutes-ish. Um, and the Six Flags trip is the same trip pretty much that we've taken I think 10 years. I think I've done it at least eight or 10 times before. We're staying at a different hotel because the hotel I usually stay at is not available, but otherwise it's all pretty much the same. Um, Can I have a motion and then we'll, we'll have a discussion? Of course. So we'll so move to a second. I have a quick question. Are yeah. there any, any further, are there any more COVID cautionary restrictions in place at this point, Aaron, for that, like on the bus or not that I'm aware of in the hotel. Not all of that's been lifted. I believe so. Other comments or questions? Oh, yes, Excuse my ignorance, but where are six flags? It's in um, Springfield ish, Mass. Oh, okay. The only one I knew was New Jersey. <laughs> 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 Any other questions or comments? How many years have you been doing it? I think like eight or ten. Uh, we've done it a lot. Seventh. seventh grade was the last time we went, so uh, five years ago. Yeah. And the kids pay for themselves? Or nope. We fundraised. We fundraised. We were supposed to go in 2020, and we had all the money funded okay. then, and we didn't get to go. So, so you just rolled that. Forward. Yep. Okay. All those in favor? Okay, and then the next is a motion to approve um, the overnight senior trip to Old Orchard Beach. <laughs> Sorry. So moved. So moved. Second. Okay. Here. Okay, so uh, my seniors 
worked on Friday and yesterday to prepare um, an idea for our senior kind of outing. We were going to just do a one day thing, but then we decided we couldn't cram everything all in one day because we live so far away from everything. So uh, the plan is to go down and spend um, Sunday the 29th um, at Funtown and then go mini golfing at Pirates Cove. Um, and then we're spending the night in a hotel in Portland. Um, and then the next day we're gonna, hopefully if it's sunny, <laughs> uh, hang out at OOB and play some you know, beach games and get our tan on. <laughs> Just getting out of routine. Um, but that's about it. Yeah. Any questions or discussion? Sounds fun. <laughs> All those in favor? Okay. Well, good luck and enjoy those trips here. Thanks. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> so I think that covers all of our business for today. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? Okay. All those in favor? Okay, thank you very much. Exactly. Oh, that warm weather. Oh, yeah.